Howdy. Science alert. Electric discharge from plants. Maybe changing air quality in ways we didn't expect. Weak electrical discharge called coronas can form on tree leaves during thunderstorms. Check them out. Charge tends to accumulate on peaks and edges. When lightning flashes above, plants on the ground may respond in kind. Scientists have long been aware that plants and trees can emit small, visible electric discharges from the tips of their leaves when the plants are trapped beneath the electrical fields generated by thunderstorms high overhead. These discharges, known as coronas, are sometimes visible as faint blue sparks that glow around charged objects. Well, the reason why I find this very interesting is that uh, we had this Glacier 3000 fire. <laughs> yeah, some... What is it called? This kind of wire thing which goes from the valley up to the hill. The top station caught fire. They don't know why. Or at least I don't know why. I haven't heard anything new about that. Maybe someone knows. Uh, there is a glacier on top of the mountain. Le Diablere or Le Diablere. And uh, there might be iron deposits within the glacier ice or it's algae. Nonetheless, like it doesn't matter in the end which one it is because it would be very interesting. If it's iron, it would be even more interesting in the electrical environment paradigm according to why the station probably caught, caught fire in the first place, accumulation on, of charge on peaks, overpowered some circuits and catched fire. I have been talking about those ferrofluids. And here's a small recap. I wonder what it did to my skin then. Maybe I'll turn into a pigeon, being able to detect the Earth's magnetic field. Nah, but use gloves when handling ferro fluid, unless you want to wake up every morning facing north. On a more serious note, have you noticed a special detail on the spikes? Some of them have a fawn at the end. I have never seen this before. After tweaking the distance between the magnet and the ferro fluid, I got this result. My guess is that this is a sign of how powerful this monster magnet really is. Its magnetic field is so strong that the magnetite in the fluid is stacked high enough to break through the surface tension of the carrier fluid. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> but let's go back to the article. Now, new research suggests those plant-based sparks may be altering the surrounding air quality in ways never recognized before. But whether the impacts of these mini-shocks in the atmosphere are positive or negative remains unclear. I somehow tried to figure out which kind of plasma creates blue color. But since I don't know anything about chemistry or whatsoever, I'm not educated in any way. I couldn't figure it out until now. Maybe I will still figure it out. <laughs> Probably depends also on the charge itself, what color it burns. I don't know. In the study published 9th of August in the Journal of Geophysical Research Atmospheres, researchers created the electrical fields from thunderstorms in the laboratory and analyzed the coronas given off by eight plant species under a range of conditions. The results showed that all of the coronas created in high abundance of radicals chemicals containing unpaired electrons that are highly reactive with other compounds which can significantly alter the surrounding air quality. While little is known about how widespread these discharges are, 
We estimate that coronas generated on trees under thunderstorms could have substantial impacts on the surrounding air. Lead study author Jenna Jenkins and atmospheric scientists at Penn State University said in a statement. The two radicals given off by the plant coronas are hydroxyl OH and hydroperoxyl OH2, both of which are neutral and are known to oxidize or steal electrons from a number of different chemical compounds, thereby transforming them into other molecules. The researchers were particularly interested in the concentrations of hydroxyl radicals because they have a greater impact on air quality. The hydroxyl radical contributes to the total atmospheric oxidation of many atmospheric pollutants, study co-author William Broom, a meteorologist at Penn State University, said in a statement. For example, if a hydroxyl hydroxyl radical reacts with greenhouse gases such as methane, they can remove the damaging molecules from the atmosphere and help combat climate change, Brun said. Then, here we have a Finnish commercial. <laughs> this is how Finnish people tackle climate change. <laughs> anyway, a tent sauna. But if the same radical reacts with oxygen, it can create ozone, which, despite playing an important role in the upper atmosphere, is toxic to humans. Radicals can also create aerosol particles that harm air quality, he added. This is not the first time that researchers have shown the link between thunderstorms and hydroxyl radicals. In 2021, the research team led by Broon found that lightning was a major progenitor or progenitor of hydroxyl radicals in the atmosphere. In their paper published in the journal Science, the team theorized that thunderstorms could be directly responsible for up to one-sixth of the hydroxyl radicals in the atmosphere. In September, another team led by Broom released a follow-up study published in the journal Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences that showed coronals produced by metallic objects such as telephone poles and transmission towers produce a slightly higher level of hydroxyl radical radicals than plant coronas. However, the levels of radicals produced by plant and artificial coronas are both significantly less than those produced directly from lightning. Even though the charge generated by the plant corona was weaker than the sparks and lightning we looked at before, we still saw extreme amounts of this hydro hydroxy radical being made. Jenkins said, considering the vast numbers of trees that are present in lightning-prone areas, plant-produced coronas may represent a majority understudied source of radicals with a highly unpredictable effect on air quality, she added. There are about two trillion trees in areas where thunderstorms are most likely to occur globally, and there are 1,800 thunderstorms going on at any given time. As a result, researchers want to continue studying these coronas in greater detail to fully understand the effect they have on localized air quality and on a wider global scale. The hydroxyl... I cannot pronounce this word, hydroxyl, Radical is the atmosphere's most important cleanser, Jenkins said. So, having a better accounting of where this stuff is being made. So it's made. Elemental transmutation, Edwin Kahn. Can give us a more complete understanding of what's happening in the atmosphere. Or... Maybe within ourselves too. 
Other studies suggest that thunderstorms may become more frequent and powerful due to the effects I cannot. Uh, of human caused climate change. No. There is not no such thing as human caused climate change. So understanding the effects of thunderstorms on air quality is vital. Hmm. During the experiments, the team made another discovery that could help accelerate this field of research. The leafy discharges gave up sharp spikes of ultraviolet radiation. This could allow the team to indirectly study where coronas are occurring in the field and measure their effects on nearby air quality. Where is the picture? We cannot zoom in, so we have to just watch at that for a second. And since we are talking about electrical discharges, it says here, Coronas. Just the fact alone we are talking about Coronas and electrical discharges. We have to remember one very important fact about this. Scalability. So imagine this would be a mountain peak and there is very bad weather and there's all of a sudden a plasma spike emerging out of the peak and there is a facility with electrical equi equipment deep freezer and deep fryer and whatever stuff they have there in a restaurant it might easily overpower the circuits that's a plant there's water inside We talk about the mountain with water inside, since there's a glacier growing on top of it. So there might be a straight relation between this electrical discharge and a possible electrical discharge on the Glacier 3000 facility. And if is if is there if there is iron within the glacier there might be more iron within the mountain, so the electromagnetic effects of there being iron would just be amplified. And if we have this algae, which needs the vitamin B12, which is very important for humans to create blood and stuff like that, which is also related to iron, our blood is red because of the iron. Maybe they're just all tied together. It's a little bit complicated. <laughs> but anyway, I think this is all very interesting. Thank you for interacting, for sending me links and this kind of things. I'm still watching this. Uh, das elektrische Universum. Sehr interessant, mal auf Deutsch sowas zu sehen. Oder zu hören, besser gesagt. But anyway, it's a little bit difficult to switch between languages. Sometimes the reading gets difficult because I sometimes know that I start to read in another language than I actually reading it out loud. So it's sometimes it, it gets stuck between 
language spheres. Because I don't know if there's anyone out there who has moved into another country, like for making a living. You have to adapt to the new culture. You probably have to learn a new language. And with learning a new language, there's a whole new universe of sayings and meanings and all these kinds of small nuances. I don't know if this word is English. I don't know. But it's all very interesting. Sayings like Aurinko porotta, like from Finnish. Aurinko porotta, aurinko means sun. Porotta means poro is a reindeer. The sun is reindeering. Yeah, actually, I just built accidentally, uh, what is it called? This kind of bridge to something else, because there would have been many things I wanted to show. But since I'm now talking about the sun is reindeering, this relates to petroglyphs. And I just had in my feed today something about Finnish petroglyphs. Let me show you that quickly. Yeah, it's not this one, but I'm into making some research about the whole thing. What we just read, but now to the petroglyphs. This has been in my feed for whatever reason. And actually now when I remember that, because I was searching between some windows I had open, like blue plasma beams, or however you want to call it. There's this plasma channel dude who has this plasma channel. And like they use this kind of plasma for disinfection in many places. Maybe Trump meant the same as he told about spring is coming. I don't know. <laughs> Vitrask rock paintings, Kirko Nummi, Finland. Kirko means church. Nummi is a way, field or something. These lakeside pictographs were some of the first pieces of prehistoric artwork found in Finland. And I don't know, I tried earlier to get something more of these, more pictures. But there seems to be just one. I'm not trying to paint anymore. Let's read quickly what they have to say about that. I haven't read it. The first ancient rock paintings discovered in Finland were found in 1911 by none other one than the Finnish composer Jean Sibelius. Situated in a beautiful cliffside spot, the composer stumbled upon them while visiting the nearby home of Finnish-American architect Elia Saarinen. Probably he was the guy who created the Ark in some town in America. The prehistoric art decorates a stone ledge about 16 meters above the waves of Lake Vitresk. When the paintings were first made, they would have been closer to the water, but due to glacial rebound over millennia, the ground has risen several meters higher above the lake. Like many other pieces of prehistoric art in Finland, the markings are reddish brown in color and feature symbols and figures of people and animals. Add photos, make an edit. No, probably it's no glacial rebound. But that's the petroglyph. And that's a part of it because they are like changing their structure. And that's, of course, Anthony Peratt. Iron nose masks. And the special branch of the University of Helsinki uses a owl as their logo. And the owl is seen as a very wise bird here in Finland. So no wonder the Finnish university uses them as their mascot. Also, 
I want to show you quickly Andy Lahelma, A Touch of Red, the very nicely made paper. Made in 2008. The year is very important to notice. Examples of different types of human figures in Finnish rock art. Two dot-headed anthropomorphs with raised hands and legs crossed. Yeah. I guess my six-year-old, now it's, she's seven, seven-year-old daughter could make the same conclusion. Yeah. Legs crossed, two dotted. Okay. Anthony Parat, recurrence, sea pinch. Squatter man. Plasma discharge events. Yeah, I just wanted to show you that. It's interesting. Like just stumbling across all these things. Just watching at the random cookie jar, and you can see all kinds of thunderbolts and and currents and archetypes of gods. Yeah, that's that's a part of my paper. You can read it through if you want to. <laughs> yeah, there's more bread instabilities. Just a random stove oven door. Many people think they don't represent anything. But I was staggered. I really had to ask, can I take a picture of this? And the person I asked, she was a little bit, yes. Like, why? Yeah. Probably I don't have time or I don't know. If you want to know, you would have had, you would need some time because probably take some time to explain to you what we are, what you are looking at, why I'm interested in that. But when I took the pictures, or this picture on the left, I probably didn't knew then that I <laughs> gonna write a paper and even gonna use it in that. But anyway, plants are electrical discharging disinfecting the environment or whatever they are what's the purpose of that there have been many other people talking about this i know many the leaves are fractal patterns the tree itself is a fractal pattern i have been thinking about there's like trees which have a bark and the leaves or needles or whatever but anyway they are trees and they are rather big let's say everything which grows more than 70 centimeters Let's call it a tree, which has a stem from where things branch off. And then we have other plants like grasses, which are in a way different. And then we have also like plants like cactuses and these meaty leaf plants, very fat leaves. And they're like really sturdy and they live in the desert and stuff like that. And many of the plants, they have this kind of repellent, water repellent surface. Like also the leaves, they don't get really wet because the water stays there in a bubble. No, it's not a bubble, it's a drop. Then I have been thinking about that. Why? How is that? What's the purpose? And I have just been thinking that, is it possible that those plants are probably too small to handle the electromagnetic charge differential between heaven and ground that in order to provide the internal rise of fluids and all the stuff the plants need and getting the what is it called chlorophytic mechanism going they cannot in a way dissolve into the electromagnetic environment created by the water and its surface tension. That's why the drops stay in drops on top of the plants, because this is how they create a somewhat double layer that they don't dissipate 
into the environmental electromagnetic circumstances or however you want to put it. But I don't know. Maybe I once find someone to ask this question. Why do some plants have these kind of features that they don't get wet from the outside? If they would just get wet, there would be a straight connection to the surrounding water and its charge, and it is probably very closely tied to the charge of the environmental blah blah blah. And so the plant probably couldn't handle anymore the pumping of the or the, the mechanism of the pumping from the roots through the whole plant to the leaves and keeping stuff going because it has to work electrically as well. So that's why I think plants, like smaller plants, or some plants, have these water repellent surfaces. But I think I have been drifting off a little bit too far. Yeah, thanks again for the inputs. I have to check out still, what is it, Thomas Gold about life within Earth and stuff like that. I don't know. I probably won't be able to purchase any books. So I have to find other ways to get knowledge out of that. Stuff is going on very much. I also recommend you to watch the very last Adapt 2030 is a two part video. Very interesting. David Dubine, Adapt 2030. Uh, I'll probably put a link below to the to his videos that just come out, came out today. One came out yesterday, the other one today or something. Check him out. We are living in very interesting times. Yes. But anyway, the owl, keep looking. Thanks. Bye.